Welcome back guys. Now in this video, let's discuss about diabetic ketoacidosis. Already we have discussed about how insulin functions. Now let's discuss about diabetic ketoacidosis where the main problem is because of the deficiency of insulin. Okay. Now, first point is where we will see this diabet uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. It's mainly seen in type 1 diabetes mellitus. Now, what is the problem with the type 1 diabetes mellitus? We all know in type 1 diabetes mellitus, there is insulin deficiency. In two, type 2 diabetes mellitus, the problem is insulin resistance, right? Now, in type 1 diabetes mellitus, yes, there is insulin deficiency. Now, whenever there is no insulin, we know that tissues cannot utilize the glucose. So, glucose utilization by the tissues is not happening, cannot utilize the glucose. Now what happened to the blood glucose levels? Blood glucose levels are increasing. So the first point is already there is increased glucose in the blood. Tissues are not able to utilize the glucose. Now let's see what will happen. See whenever the tissues are not able to utilize the glucose, the tissues want glucose. Right? So tissues are giving the message that there is no glucose in the blood. Why? Because they can, yes, glucose is there, but they cannot utilize the glucose. So what happens in the body? Body will think that there is no glucose. So body is going to produce counter regulatory hormones. Okay, counter regulatory hormones are being produced. What are the counter regulatory hormones, guys? The counter regulatory hormones are glucose, epinephrine, cortisol, and growth hormone. We have already discussed all these hormones will increase the blood glucose levels. And all these hormones are going to be produced whenever there is decreased blood glucose, right? So these counter regulatory hormones are getting produced. Now what will happen? So all these hormones are going to act on the liver. Now in the liver, who is there? Glycogen is there. Now whenever these hormones are acting on the liver, glycogen is going to broke down into glucose that the uh, reaction is called, that uh, process is called as glycogenolysis. So automatically glycogenolysis is going to happen. So whenever these hormones are acting on the liver, glycogen is being broken down that is glycogenolysis. And see, not only glycogenolysis but gluconeogenesis is also happening. Why gluconeogenesis is happening? Why? Because tissues cannot utilize the glucose. See, even after glycogenolysis, yes, there is glucose, but that glucose cannot be utilized by the tissues. So, what happens now? Gluconeogenesis is happening. What is gluconeogenesis? Production of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. Something like production of glucose from proteins. Okay. So, from proteins and from lipids. So from proteins and lipids, glucose is being produced. That process is called as glyco, uh, gluconeogenesis. So at the end of the day, what's happening? Glucose is being produced. But can this glucose be utilized by the tissues? No, tissues cannot utilize the glucose. So what happens? Plasma load of glucose, the plasma concentration of glucose is increasing so much. When plasma glucose concentration increases so much, automatically lot of glucose is also getting filtered in the nephron. So the amount of glucose filtering in the nephron, that's called as the filtered load of glucose is going to be increased. When filtered load increases, the nephrons cannot reabsorb all the glucose. Lots and lots of glucose is getting filtered. Now all this glucose cannot be reabsorbed. So what happens? Now glucose starts to leak in urine. Glucose is highly osmotically active. Glucose is going along with the glucose even water follows. So osmotic diuresis happen. So as the filtered load of glucose increases, glucose reabsorption, 100% glucose reabsorption cannot happen. Glucose will go into the urine that is a glucose urea will happen. Glucose is a osmotically active substance. It will drag the water along with it. So osmotic diuresis will happen. Now because of this osmotic diuresis, see there is polyuria. We can see polyuria in a patient with the diabetic uh, uh, ketoacidosis. Why? Because of glucose urea. Osmotic diuresis is happening. So he is going to urine so many times, polyuria. Now whenever he is losing so much amount of his body fluids in the form of uh, urine, what will happen? Definitely he is going to have excessive thirst. So that is polydipsia is also seen. 
okay polydipsia what exactly is this polydipsia excessive thirst and also whenever lots of volume depletion is happening that will cause dehydration so from this we can say a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis is suffering with dehydration true polydipsia true and as well as polyuria polydipsia is because of polyuria and polyuria is because of osmotic diuresis osmotic diuresis is because of loss of glucose in the urine okay so this is one half of the story now in the name itself it's see diabetic ketoacidosis we know why the patient is diabetic why? because the blood glucose levels are increasing diabetic type 1 diabetes mellitus patient then what exactly is this ketoacidosis see whenever tissues are not able to utilize the glucose you have to your body have to provide certain energy for the tissues now fats are going to be broken down in the adipose tissue fats are undergoing lipolysis okay lipolysis fats are getting broken down into which substances fatty acids even fatty acids are also energy rich substances fatty acids are getting produced now these fatty acids they will go to liver where they are getting converted into ketone bodies these ketone bodies are also energy rich substances see ketone bodies are getting produced in a person with diabetic ketoacidosis because of lipolysis now what exactly are these ketone bodies examples include acetone beta hydroxybutyrate acetone beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate all these substances are examples of keto acids now in this person's blood you can see lots and lots of keto acids and because of this keto acids the patient is suffering with acidosis so diabetic ketoacidosis is because of the presence of this acetone beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate and also this person who is, whoever is having this diabetic ketoacidosis he will be having very sweet breath why he is having sweet breath is because of the acetone now this acetone in the blood is the one responsible for the sweet breath okay and whenever the person is suffering with acidosis we know definitely the patient is going to have some changes in the breathing now this diabetic ketoacidosis patient he will be a uh, breathing heavily the type of breathing is called as kusumal's breathing kusumal's breathing will also be seen so this acetone beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetates these are the ones responsible for the metabolic acidosis in the patient okay metabolic acidosis along with that you should also know a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis will also suffer with the metabolic abnormalities or especially electrolyte abnormalities okay why there are electrolyte abnormalities you should know see especially potassium abnormalities will be seen not only potassium abnormalities sodium abnormalities chlorine abnormalities will also be seen but this potassium abnormality is very much important why because try to understand like this now the patient is suffering with what acidosis the patient is having suffering with acidosis so he is having acids more number of acids in the blood now we have already studied about the buffer system in urinary uh, physiology also in the renal physiology also we have seen the first line of buffers are bicarbonate second line of buffers are proteins we have seen right in the same way whenever the acidosis is happening in the body now the body cells will try to take up this excessive hydrogen ions okay from the blood the protons are being uptaken into the tissues so protons are going into the cells now whenever protons are going into the cells one positive charge is going into the cell right so, to maintain the electron neutrality one positive charge is kicked out of the cell that potassium is coming out so in the blood you will see hyperkalemia metabolic abnormality or the uh, electrolyte abnormality is seen so whenever a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis comes to you be concerned with the potassium uh, electrolyte imbalances why because even a small fluctuation can kill the patient because of the tachyarrhythmias okay so proton is being uptaken into the cell in exchange for the proton potassium is being coming out of the cell so that causes electrolyte abnormalities guys okay now how to treat this condition very simple all this is because of the insulin deficiency so what we can do we can simply treat this condition by giving the insulin so whenever you give the insulin it decreases the ketogenesis in the liver automatically whenever there are no ketone bodies there is no acidosis so very easily we can treat uh, this uh, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis by giving insulin so insulin is a drug of choice for diabetic ketoacidosis and also remember whenever you give insulin this insulin we know it will cause potassium influx into the cell okay okay 
So one of the important questions that will come in your exam is whenever you are treating diabetic ketoacidosis, what you should keep in mind? What which electrolyte abnormality will occur now? See, whenever you give insulin, that insulin will stimulate the potassium influx back into the cell that causes hypokalemia. Okay, guys, hope the video is helpful. See you in the next video. Thank you.